Hello, Tim Spector here of the Zoe COVID study on the latest Q&A and thanks for those great questions that you've been putting in to us from the app and we've got some good ones today and the first one is about lateral flow tests. This one is saying what is the current sensitivity of lateral flow tests and how good are they at detecting these new variants of the virus? And while, while the variants are all different and they're going to continue to mutate and change, this means the genes get rearranged a little bit and the structure of that virus is just slightly different. The good news is that all the tests are based on some core elements of the virus protein, which means that uh, even if these, these changes continue to happen, it's still going to pick up the same key bits of the virus. And these are things like the spike protein that aren't changing because they're essential really for how that virus functions. So don't worry, these uh, tests will uh, pick up uh, all the variants that we're seeing or we're likely to see in the near future. And while we're on this, it's, it's worth talking about the actual sensitivity of the uh, test itself. Now, uh, as you know, there's two types of tests. There's the lateral flow test, which is the ones uh, that you get in these uh, boxes here from the uh, your local chemist, or you can get sent to you at home. Uh, and these come in special packs. Uh, and you simply uh, take these nasal swabs, stick them first in your mouth, up, uh, and swab inside your right of the back of the throat near your tonsils uh, scrape around there for a bit until you just start to gag and then you put it one up into each nostril and twirl it around five times each should be quite unpleasant in order to get high enough up to make sure you're in the right place and then you put it uh, back into this tube here and uh, follow the rest of the instructions or if it's a PCR test you'd send it back to the lab now, what uh, the lateral flow test is uh, not very good at is it will miss quite a few cases. So um, it's probably going to miss um, something between 30% and 50% of cases that might be picked up by PCR test. And if you are, uh, do get a positive result, there is a somewhere between a, a one in a thousand or one in or four in a thousand chance that that's a false positive. So it depends how many cases are around you. If at the moment there's a big outbreak in the school and it's positive, it's quite quite likely it's positive. But if there hasn't been nothing around you for months, it's less likely. Uh, in all those cases, you should repeat the test um, because doing these regularly makes sure they, they work much better. And if you do two in a row, then it's highly unlikely to be a false positive with a positive. Uh, the PCR test is uh, slightly more sensitive, picks up perhaps uh, in good hands about 70 or 80 percent of cases uh, it's, and has a very low false positive rate. So is at the moment the gold standard. But realize that when when there's a lot of mild infection, it's sometimes harder to pick up the virus particles and this might be the case at the moment we might be misdiagnosing it so uh, hope you understand more about this definitely worth doing these tests uh, with the the new variant around the delta variant and it will pick it up if it's positive repeat it even if it's negative uh, do repeat it there are plenty of tests around and as i said doing it once doesn't really prove that you haven't got it um, so it's it's worth knowing that Hope that answers that question. So we've got a couple of questions which we combined together um, from Beth and, and uh, Anonymous. Uh, one is, uh, this comes up a lot, this question. It's, I've got two sons aged 20 and 21 who uh, back in March were given the AstraZeneca vaccine and have since got worried about the possibility of having uh, blood clots and would like 
the possibility of switching to another vaccine. And so um, how does this work? And in a way, our related question is, boosters are likely to be coming in at the end of the year and they could be any make. So in a way, we're going to be exposed to different types of vaccines. How that? How is that going to affect us? We're talking about uh, mixing and matching and most of the specialist immunologists don't see a problem with this, that this is likely to be the future anyway as we continually uh, adapt our response to this virus over the next few years. We will be getting different types of vaccines, each with a different uh, capacity to do things and little add-on devices that will um, counteract anything that the virus uh, is trying to sneakily uh, avoid our defences. Now, it's been common practice to keep people having the same jabs, the same manufacturer, but it's not dangerous to do otherwise. And there are early studies showing that if you have two different types of vaccine, your antibody response is actually higher than you just have uh, two of the same type. So it's looking like uh, this will become the norm, but it's not that proven. So no one's officially going to say this is a great idea yet, but my view is this will be the future and you certainly shouldn't worry about it. And uh, the there are obviously important to understand the difference between the traditional vaccines like the AstraZeneca Oxford one and the BioNTech Pfizer one are that the newer ones, the Pfizer one, the Moderna one, use RNA and a very different way of um, getting antibodies against the, the virus. And they're both effective, but they work in, in very different ways. So if you combine them, you might get the benefits of both, but you might also get uh, potential side effects of both. So that has to be uh, weighed up against each other. Um, going back to Beth's question about her sons, uh, what's interesting is that for the most part, the clots have come on after the first dose. So you're even less likely to get uh, clots uh, having had a, if you have a second shot than after the first shot and remember the risks of getting uh, a bad clot are really uh, very low uh, the latest estimates I saw were about one in uh, 300,000 and so that's really important to bear in mind so the risks are pretty trivial the risks of uh, getting COVID getting long COVID are much greater and again, for women who are uh, thinking of or have taken oral contraceptives, uh, the risks are very much lower than uh, risk of clotting in it for contraception or for HRT. Next question comes from Caroline, who asked the question, Public Health England say the AstraZeneca is 60% effective against infection of the Indian variant, uh, but that still leaves quite a risk, that 40%. And is this 60% for all or less in uh, obese or high risk individuals? So great question. And I think we'll also talk a bit about um, the, the fact that uh, there is this preliminary study out showing that the AstraZeneca jab was 60% effective uh, against the uh, so-called Indian variant, which we're now calling the Delta variant, compared to 66% uh, against the original Kent or Alpha variant. So about a 10% difference, uh, which I think we should treat with a, a pinch of salt because those numbers were very small and they, they could have easily changed, but assume there is this slight difference. So in all the studies so far, we've looked at in Zoe with over a million uh, of your vaccines logged. We've consistently seen a, a difference in reinfection rate in the group uh, to, who had originally the Pfizer vaccine versus 
the AstraZeneca one. And this was most marked after uh, one dose where the uh, Pfizer one was obviously working faster, quicker. And so we were getting um, over 70% protection after that single dose and we're only seeing something like 40 to 50% with the AstraZeneca. Once we get people have had two shots, the difference between the vaccines gets uh, smaller. So we see about 95% protection with Pfizer and about uh, 85% uh, protection with the AstraZeneca. So <clears throat> I think the question was more aimed at what, you know, what happens after one shot. In a way, with one shot, everyone needs to take care because um, everyone is still at risk. And realize that no vaccine is ever 100% effective. And even 95% means that 5% of people will still uh, get ill. And some people are, are less protected than others. And we've, we've looked at this in detail. And it looks like the healthier your lifestyle in general, the more that vaccine is going to work for you, the better your immune response to it. But people who are overweight, uh, who don't exercise, have poor quality diets, uh, and may have other uh, medical conditions or are living in, in a state of, uh, of deprivation, uh, are definitely more at risk. And so particularly important, those people do get their second shot on time or if possible earlier because they are slightly more likely to get those infections. The next question comes from uh, Anonymous who says, could we show the current infection rates across the age bands and see this if it's related to vaccine uptake uh, to see if the link has been broken? And we can't do this precisely just because the data isn't that good at very local levels on vaccinations. But what we, we can do is look at the, the ZOE data based on age and the, in these regions. And we can see that the, the ZOE data is showing that the current rise in cases, um, which has been going up steadily for the last week, really linked to relaxation of lockdown, is happening um, only in the under, under 40s and very little is happening in the over 50s. So as vaccination rates are very much linked to age, this is a pretty good proxy of uh, what's going on. So we can therefore assume that if you've had those two jabs, um, you're much greater protection in those groups than uh, people who've only had either none or, or one, in, and they tend to be in those younger age groups. Uh, and, and the localized outbreaks we're seeing, particularly in the greater Manchester area, the Northwest, and the area around Glasgow can't really be explained just by vaccination uptake. So uh, yes, there are some uh, local differences in vaccination rates and that could explain some of this, but I think most of it is, is really explained on the basis of uh, the younger age uh, groups being uh, out socializing and getting infections. And they might be spreading it to some people who are only partially vaccinated, but that's not the main reason. And so currently it isn't clear what is driving these particular outbreaks. It could be these were uh, areas that people came from the Indian subcontinent. And there's some overlap when you look at the maps of that. But uh, we still need to understand more and, and also why they are tend to be in... Uh, more crowded, more deprived areas of the country. And we are still seeing a five-fold difference between the uh, regions of the country. But certainly we need to find out more because at the moment rates are still going up and we obviously need to keep a close eye on this. Thanks for the questions. And uh, if you do want to uh, keep getting uh, notifications of this video, press the subscribe button uh, click notifications and uh, like us and next time the video goes, goes live you'll see us. So thanks for logging and thanks for being so inquisitive and asking great questions.